is not here, and so Giovanni asked me to chair this session. Um, we have three talk, and um, the session is application and concept of classification. So I clearly focused on the topics of this conference, and uh, the organizer of the, the, the of the session is uh, Adalbert Wille. And uh, we have uh, one hour and 50 minutes, so I consider 20 minutes for each presentation, and uh, we can reserve some time for the uh, questions and the, the, the discussion. So the first speaker is uh, Andreas Schulz, and uh, the title of the, his talk is a Symmetry in Graph Clustering. So it's your thank, thank you for your introduction, Francesco. Uh, my talk will be about symmetry in graph clustering, and I would like to say that that comes back to a talk in Modena where we started about this. And yeah, and I'll start out with the motivation. Then I will give you lots of technical details about variance and invariance of, of, of question of the invariance of measures. I will show some measure decompositions, and finally I'll show you how this question reflects to clustering results in graphs with symmetry. And the final part is I will try to show that this is a problem which also occurs in real graphs, because this was one of the problems we couldn't publish anything for years. Let's start out with my motivation first. I have here two, a single very simple graph yeah, and two different types of the simplest possible case. And actually what one would think of is that the RAND measure or any other partition comparison measure could distinguish the cases. Now let's have a little bit uh, a closer look into the whole thing. And the first picture shows you that structurally identical partitions have different, a different RAND index. Yeah? Basically, P1 and P2 are structurally equivalent, but the RAND index is about one third. Yeah? And my second example, which should give you, again, uh, some food for thought is that if you look this at these structurally different partitions, yeah? but which are unequal, and you have structurally identical partitions, then all of them have the equal RAND index. And basically, this should not happen. Why does it occur? Yeah? And uh, now I speak from a purely mathematical point of view. Uh, basically, the proper treatment of this would be to have equivalence sets of partitions and the measures work between the equivalent sets of the partitions. And that brings us to the idea to have invariant graph partition comparison measures. And this is what I'll show you. Um, basically, if you go back, then humans are really good at reading this text. So every one of you can read this um, text, which is disturbed just by permutations and the invariant thing I show you is just the first and the last letter. And in between is a random permutation, but I guess everybody can read what's on there. Yeah? And that shows us that the human brain really can do this stuff. And in data analysis, I doubt that we could do this. So, so we really have a problem. Now comes the outline of my talk. I will try to stumble through quite a lot of stuff. The first problem is this just a problem of the RAND index. We have many other partition comparison measures, and is does any one of the published partition comparison measures solve this? And the answer is no. Yeah, all partition comparison measures have the same problem, and you, I will show you just a short mathematical proof for this. We also have done it the hard way. Yeah? by just looking at what happens for the partition comparison measures by proving it by counterexample. Then the second step is we construct three classes of invariant graph partition comparison measures. And if, as soon as we have done this, we can decompose measures in a of 
what is the structural part and what is the effect of an automorphism effect. Uh, so that's a group transformation which gives you an identical graph. Um, then we come to two toy examples. I will show you what happens in the karate graph and whether this well-known optimal clustering really is an optimal clustering and stable or if it is something else. And I will also show you uh, that we can now cluster um, completely transitive graphs. So that is, we can do structural clustering of completely transitive class by doing clustering stuff on the equivalence classes that we have seen. And the final part is we have done a large scale study on real graphs and I will show you that this affects real graphs. Of course I need some mathematical preliminaries and what we look at is the simplest possible case in groove theory that's a finite permutation group and I just need very little of this. That simply means when a group H acts on a set V, a node U is mapped by the elements of H onto other nodes. And we call the set of these images the orbit of U under H. Yeah? And this is here how we write this down. This actually covers your face recognition, all your re face recognition graphs too. And the second part is if you switch, of course, from a permutation group setting to other groups that you have available. Then the group of permutations HU, which fixes U, we call a stabilizer of U under H. So th these are the two things that we actually use from this theory. Then we also can look at the orbit stabilizer theorem. This says it links the order of a permutation group with the cardinality of an orbit and the order of the stabilizer. Uh, this theorem says something of the size of the equivalence classes that we have to look at in order to treat this for graphs. Okay, now we will define uh, what is an invariant measure. Second, uh, an invariant measure yeah, simply means, uh, that means a partition comparison measure M which goes from the set of all partitions to the set of all partitions on R is invariant under automorphism if the measure of PQ is the m equals the measure of the P tilde and Q tilde and you get P tilde and Q tilde as any element out of the finite set of images under the automorphism, automorphism group of the graph. Yeah? And now, the, if the surprising thing for, for us was that invariant measures do not exist because of the following theorem. Yeah? That is, if you have a graph with more than two nodes and a non-trivial automorphism group, then you have for the partition comparison measures that I have defined before for, the, for this M, it's impossible to fulfill jointly yeah, the identity axiom and the axiom of invariance. Yeah? And this is quite surprising that this is a long known proof by Orman and Shapley from 1974 from non-cooperative game theory. And you have to note that if you take out a partition out of the set of all possible partitions of, on the node set of a graph, then this is either stable and that means you have only a trivial automorphism group or it's unstable. It's on a non-trivial orbit of automorphism group. If P and Q are on trivial orbits of out G and P unequal G, then it follows from the identity axiom that this MPQ must be unequal to C. Yeah? But from the unvariance axiom, we know that this must be C because the group action is an isomorphism. And if you combine both axioms together, you have made a contradiction. C is MPQ and that is unequal to C. And so both of this stuff cannot happen. Yeah? Uh, this is a basically a just a derived contradiction just by trivially applying the axiom sets for invariance and from the rest. Yeah? Uh, the idea is not new, that goes back to Aumann and Shapley of 1974 in the question of the valuation of uh, the value of cooperation 
in games, in certain forms of games. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a second proof with me that's in the appendix that is doing this for each measure by producing a counter example. Yeah, that can also be done. Okay, now if we want to deal with this, we must uh, construct metric and pseudometric spaces. That means if you have a metric for a space S, then there you have a distance function with the usual properties of symmetry, identity, and triangle inequality. And that's the metric in a standard space. Now, if you have these group automorphisms, then what we do now is we construct what we call a pseudometric space. That is, we use the, equi the equivalence classes as elements. Yeah? That means in the pseudometric space, we use a, what we call a metric D star, uh, which fulfills the identity condition for every two elements which are in the same equivalent class. Yeah, that means whenever two structurally identical metrics are in the same equivalence class, then we just said it's zero. Yeah? And that, for graphs, this simply mean we just construct yeah, uh, the equivalence classes for a partition by applying the automorphism group. And we can do construct for each partition the set of equivalence classes. Yeah? And a partition P in S corresponds to its orbit P or G in S star. Yeah? And that's the main result. It's very simple, actually. Yeah? And now we have a, a set of spaces. We have a S in the original D, that's the metric space in the original space. Then we have a metric space on S star, D star, that's a metric space on the equivalence classes. And then we have a combination uh, where we have the S, the group transformation on the D star, and that's what we call a pseudometric space. Yeah? And this last one gives us the transformation of a partition to its equivalence class. Okay, a simple example will help. Yeah? Uh, if you look at the butterfly graph, then the generator of the automorphism group is actually can be given by these two permutations, G1, we switch 1 and 2, and G4, we switch 1 and 4 and 2 and 5. Yeah? And from this you can generate the whole eight generators that do this. Yeah? And if you look now at the equivalence classes of the butterfly graph, then you will see that, for instance, this is not the all equivalence classes, but only those of partition type 113. Then you will see here that we have three equivalence classes for this partition type. And within this, this whole thing is, this, all these partitions are equivalent, but they are nevertheless structurally different. Yeah? So this is a sort of presentation. Yeah? Now, how do we really compute invariant measures between equivalence classes. And a very simple idea which works for small permutation groups is we simply compute all distances between the pairs in, in S1 and S2, and then we get a set of distances. And some of these numbers characterize the set of distances, and they are invariant under the transformations. And the usual candidates for this are the minimum of the values, the maximum, and the average. Yeah? And for finite sets, which of these numbers are really distances? Yeah? Okay, the first one are those given by Felix Hausdorff, which are really old stuff in mathematics. I'm sorry for this, but I have rephrased this here just in the language of finite permutation groups. And it means that we either take the minimum of this or the maximum of this yeah. Um, okay. So zero and the maximum of this, and the computing of, comp of and the complexity of computing this from a finite set of permutations is simply O n square. Yeah. Uh, that then we need the diameter of S. This is the maximum distance as a definition, and uh, this is the idea of John von Neumann uh, on his postmortem pub publication of. 1998 on a lecture given in 1940, which was a real surprise for me. Yeah. 
this is the lectures on invariant measures, and there you will find that, the, that also the average measures are invariant. And the point is, which I have not worked out yet, or thought about working out yet, is if you use the class of John von Neumann, you do not have to enumerate everything, but if you do have a proper random way of constructing the orbit, then you can have a, you apply a large, uh, I would say, a convergence theorem that enables you to find a close approximation without covering it, and with this you can cover even very large uh, permutation groups without brute force implementation. Um, we have looked at this, and basically I have done implemented some computations for this, and the uh, first point is um, if you implement it naively, then you have four cases, and the first case has a complexity of O n square. So you really, this is huge. Yeah? And uh, if one of these is one, and the other is la the, if one of the equivalence, and this depends on the cardinality of the equivalence classes. Yeah? So this S1 is, these are two equivalence classes, and if it's one, the complexity is one, and if it's one is non-trivial and the other is trivial, then it's n, yeah? and if both are non-trivial, it's O n square. However, one can do better than this. Yeah? That is if, you, if I use, okay, I'll, I'll try to be fast. If it, the, whole, the whole point is if you choose a partition on one orbit, then this is the choice of the reference coordinate system of this and you measure the distance of this partition to all partitions on the other orbit and take the minimum maximum average and if we use this simple idea, yeah, then we also know that measurements that are invariant should be independent of the choice of the reference coordinate system and therefore both measurements must give the same result and then you come down to the following complexity. So you, the first case, we can reduce the complexity to O n and for the others to O1, O1, and O1, and that's a nice sort of some computational theorem, that's the computational theorem where I won't show you the proofs, which gives you this complexity reduction, which makes this actually quite fast. Okay? Uh, then we can also show that uh, the upper, lower, and average measures are metrics, and I'll have formulated two theorems for the fact that this is like this, and that show you that we really have invariance invariant metrics, and again the proof is um, for each case a little bit longer. However, having done this, we can decompose. That is, we can get structural measures, three different structural measures, and three additional effects of the automorphism group relative to the measure we have chosen, and this shows you how we have constructed this. Okay, and that means we can really look at automorphism effects in graphs. Okay, for instance, for instance, for the um, equivalence classes of the butterfly graph, we can find out if I take something out uh, 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 partition P out of the class E13 and Q out of the class E5, then I have an uh, invariant rand. Yeah, you see here the structural part 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and the automorphic shifts, and you see uh, basically that's the same thing for all of the things. Yeah? And you can go on and do other things of this. Now I come to my two toy examples, and I hope I'm f I will finish then with this. The toy example show you here for the karate graph, the uh, bold nodes are those which are affected by the three automorphism groups we have in the graph. And it's clear that the optimal solution remains stable as long as the bold, uh, bounder, the, the, the bold nodes do not go to another cluster. We have indicated the cluster by artificially lengthening certain nodes that you can visually detect the, the, the for clusters in the group. And what you see is in this case, the automorphisms in the karate graph do not affect the stability of the final solution. So this worked. This is a good one. Yeah. Okay. However, we can also detect if we use test partitions. We can detect with our way. Yeah. Uh, also the effects of 
violation of this, and we can give you stable measures on which which really detect which are, what is affected if we do it. Yeah, by the measurement. Okay. And my second toy example is the Patterson graph, and the whole point is that the Patterson graph can be clustered. Yeah. And basically, I have, we have analyzed three solutions, the almost modularity optimal partitions, the pairs, and nucleobase ring solutions. Yeah? The first one is not perfect, but that's an error in the algorithm. But the other two are derivable with the same algorithm, which just does a reweighting uh, on the idea of how the modularity measure is computed. And now we can ask how many optimal partitions are there for pairs and rings. And I'll give you this, if you look at the generators for the graph, then you see here the number of equivalent optimal solutions for all these various kinds. This, that's on top. And I'll skip the measurement results. Yeah, this is, I think I'll have to skip. The only last thing I want to show you, it also matters in uh, reality. We have analyzed symmetric graphs in, from the network repository graphs. Uh, network re from the graph repository in networkrepository.com and the main result is that only 30% of the 902 graphs are really asymmetric. And if you look at the simplified graphs, that's another, there are only 20.5% asymmetric. And uh, this is the first part. And the second part is, uh, does the asymmetry, the, the symmetry present in the graphs affect the, sol the optimal solution of a modularity graph stuff? And, uh, I, and the point is, yeah, if you have the symmetric graphs, then lots of graphs are affected. Yeah? That, simpl that simply means the, the impact of symmetry on the clustering results is there. And for these graphs from the first part of the analysis, these are simple graphs which are unstable under modularity optimal partitions. That simply means we have a multiple set of optimal partitions. And second, uh, that it makes a difference on which partitions you look like. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. And uh, it's time for uh, one, two uh, questions, uh, if uh, any. Mm, no. Uh, OK, so thank you again. Uh, and uh, um, next uh, talk uh, will be given by Hans Kessler. And uh, the title is a joint work uh, with uh, Ludwig Lauser, uh, Robin Nankley, Nankley, and uh, Attila, his name is <laughs> Clean Man. And uh, the title is Invariant Concept Classes from uh, Transcript Transcriptocom Classification. Better, better like this, okay. Okay, I think it's a little bit hard if I point to the screen and nobody sees where I'm pointing to, so I'm trying to do it like this. Um, okay, what I will be talking about um, is a general idea we developed in the last maybe uh, half a year or something like that. Um, we basically want to um, classify transcriptome data. I don't know if you, anybody of you knows what transcriptome data, maybe some of you. It's RNA data, RNA, we have the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA, RNA, protein. And this is extremely high dimensional data and what extremely high dimensional means, you will see in the course of the talk. It um, goes up to a million, not the data we analyzed here. So we have very high dimensional spaces with usually a low number of samples, very low number of samples. And this makes one, one thing obvious that we often don't need very complex classifiers. 
So usually linear classifiers are sufficient. And what this talk will be about is that we sort of reduce, even reduce the complexity of this type of classifier to get invariances that we have in our concept class that we don't have to measure or don't have to estimate anymore. So um, how are clinical decisions uh, support systems usually made up? Um, and this is now coming with the digitization even more prevalent and the molecular data that is um, collected for every patient even more um, increasingly important. Currently, we are working on panels which are on the size of 400 features, 400 measurements of transcriptome data or changes on the molecular level, um, genetic changes. So, but this will increase in due course to a very high number of dimensions. So, the human expert cannot handle that anymore. So, we have to have some sort of machine, a classifier, everyone knows that. We have a classification conference and, um, yeah, to help this support. So this is a very simplified, of course, a very simplified um, idea of what is going to happen. No physician wants to um, give out the decision to a machine. So this is just one part of the whole decision what to do in, in a medical environment. And what we also have, we have for this data, we have a very high variability. And this high variability comes from the how the data is generated or measurement. So we have the organism, we have a population of these things, we have cell preparation, DNA extraction, hybridization. And we also have, if you think of um, multi-center studies, we have differences in technical equipment, personal staff, consortia. So this all induces variability and in how to tackle this. And the idea here is now to sort of put this into the concept class of the classifier. Of course, this is the life cycle of a diagnostic model. You have the training phase, and this is a um, inductive training thing. You have an untrained classifier here, line. You adapt it, and then you have the prediction phase. I'm not talking about transductive classification here. And of course, everyone, or most of you probably know linear classifiers. Linear classifiers divide the space into there. In, in, into two parts. So we have a hyperplane here, and uh, the way we set this hyperplane is done in various ways. So we have like the perceptron algorithm, we have the linear support vector machine, we have LDA. Nothing really special here. And as I also mentioned, we have very high dimensional data. For low dimensional data, which we now have in some occasions, like uh, Google does a lot of um, collecting of these data, uh, we can maybe do something like in the direction of density estimation. But here, we have extremely high dimensional data. We cannot do that. And the real data that I'm showing um, you today, or the results on that real data, will be in the number of uh, samples 28 to, two, uh, to 900. And the number of features will be in the range of 7,000 to 22,000. So it's not, it's moderately high, the number of Usually, some or for genetic data, it even goes much higher. So, a learning classification rules. The inductive training of a classifier is mainly dependent by uh, three components. We have a concept class, which is interchangeable and data independent. We have training samples; they are fixed, and we have a training function. So, training functions could be perceptron, learning rule, LDA, support vector machines, etc. And the concept class is the linear. Concept class of a linear classifier, it's hidden here in the indicator function, and we have a threshold here, and then it's either on this side or the other one. And what we're now trying to do, and now the some theory comes in, but I won't mention theory going with Adrian's talk before I just try to present some concepts, um, is to construct less complex classifiers that have some invariance properties. And we did that. We did that, and uh, unfortunately, one cannot see that very um, well here. It's offset-free, 
then it's a linear contrast classifier offset free and linear contrast and pairwise comparisons. So here you see a little bit better the invariance to the um, changes in the data that they should be invariant to. So I just mentioned two or three. You will see that illustrated in a few uh, seconds. So invariant concept classes, what do we mean by that? A concept class is called invariant against a parameterized class of data transformation if each is invariant against some function. And the invariant classifier, of course, can cope with that. Nothing very special here, just formalized. We have sample invariants, cascaded invariants, and what I want to draw your attention to, inherited in, um, invariant inheritance. So we, if we have like classifiers that uh, work on a um, support, like um, if we want to combine these decisions like in a multi-classifier setting, this invariance is inherited. And for one of these classifiers, it is that one. So, so these are, this is one of the results. We have like uh, four different subclasses. We have generated four different invariant subclasses. This is the standard linear classifier. Then we have transition invariants, scale invariants, we call these concept classes con um, and, and offset free. And then we have a combined uh, classification um, a concept class. And then we have an even more less complex uh, class, uh, which is invariant against order preserving transformations. I won't go too much into that. Okay. So, and also these classifiers, so basically the same classifiers here, they also are dependent on a different number of features. So for the most simple, we only can use that on two features. And for that, we search through a whole space of all pairs. So <clears throat> this is, should illustrate what we mean by, mm, by some of these um, invariance properties. So if the we have a standard linear classifier. If it changes the boundary, of course, it changes the class. So this would be global scaling. This would be global tran transition. And this would be some sort of combination. So and for some of these um, sub subtype classifiers, we achieve offset free. For an offset free classifier, we achieve invariance against global scaling. Against gl uh, for a contrast classifier, we achieve uh, invariance against uh, global transition. And what you see here is here's the threshold gone, and here we have an, an additional constraint of a zero sum on the weights. And then we can combine this. We, I will skip that. And um, on the sideline for, um, um, to, 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 to characterize if our notion or uh, or in positions of making these more inflexible, these classifiers, and thus increasing generalization ability, um, the VC dimension should be reduced. And we, and we, and we um, derive the VC dimension for this. So this is the standard linear classifier. It has a VC dimension, babnik chabonenkis dimension, and this can be linked to pack, pack learning. It doesn't mean that it really proves good for sample size estimation in practice, but it gives you some hierarchy here. And for these reduced complex classifiers, we can we have a VC dimension reduced by one and even by by two to this. And uh, for the uh, classifier that I didn't mention so much, <laughs> that only realizes two input features, goes down to two. So how can we implement that? Of course, we can implement that in various ways. But of course, we use the most popular linear classifier scheme, which is the support vector machine. All Probably most of you know how that works. It's a large margin classifier, and it sets the decision boundary in this way. So the blue line is the one that um, it maximizes the margin between those two classes. And of course, if they overlap, you have some uh, slack variables and so on. So the optimization constraint is here. And this now, this should be red. So, the, so here you see the additional constraints. One of them I just briefly mentioned is the zero sum here. And, and we have additional constraints to get these um, classifiers more inflexible and thus 
with a high generalization ability. Now the question was, does that really hold in practice? Does that really help us? Does, do we have changes and so on? And that's what I uh, will try to convince you. Yes, we do. Um, so the evaluation was first based on artificial data. So we have uh, noise-free data. So we have um, two normal distributions. We have a class one and class two, and we want to separate that and so on. That's how we generated our uh, training data, and then we tested on the same uh, test data. Not on the same test data, but we generated with the same process our test data. And what you see here, uh, for higher dimensions, and here's the number of dimension uh, as the number of dimension goes up, we don't see a change, and here's the change on the y-axis, the change to the general li linear classifier. We don't see such a big change. So what is actually quite nice, we find a good subspace to fit our restricted hyperplane to. Okay? So what is a little bit uh, strange, or not strange, but which is actually um, expected if uh, we have this um, SVM1, this is the one that only relies on two features. Um, we, we don't have this um, benefit of finding a subspace, a good subspace, because we only rely, always only rely on two features. So we also did this um, with some transform test samples. And here you see the uh, transformations, so some random transformations global scaling, global transition, and some exponential values. What we see basically here is now the noisy data. What we basically see here, and if you see a, an equal, it means it's as good as the, the uh, standard linear classifier. So basically what we see here is what we put into the whole process, which is kind of nice, um, yeah, but would be expected. Now we come to the uh, real data, and we tested 27 different types of um, uh, microarray data and RNA-seq data, which is quite a number. And you see here the number of samples and the number of features. And um, this will almost be my almost last slide. And what you see here is, for many cases, um, the linear and the subtypes uh, classifiers are quite well, are quite good. And we don't have a change. We compare that to nearest neighbor and random forests. Um, we don't really have a change in the classification performance. Sometimes, sometimes we are even slightly better uh, with these reduced um, classifiers. So these are just some of the examples. Sometimes random forests are better, but they are quite complex here, random forest 100, 200, 300 is the number of forest, uh, trees we use in the random forest um, process. Okay, just to conclude, um, I hopefully am in time. The concept class of linear classifiers incorporates many different subclasses, uh, which can be distinguished according to the structural properties. So we have data independent pro uh, uh, properties, which we impose in the concept class. This was important for us. We are not relying on the distribution of the data. These properties can directly affect the type of information used for the final classification process, and they can be used to reduce or even preclude malicious effects on the data representation. Because we generally don't know if we have a multi-center study what type of noise we have. And uh, these concept classes can be chosen a priori and therefore not affected by data dependent biases. And that and a picture of Ulm and its extremely big church, which is really very big. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hans, and also thank you for respecting the time and effort. And uh, I'll ask the floor if uh, there are any questions. Actually, I uh, probably uh, I didn't grasp all the as technical aspect of uh, your uh, study, and uh, so uh, the um, let's say the curiosity, and you have uh, uh, in uh, an a priori uh, definition that is given by an expert, 
and uh, all the analysis is uh, uh, is all the analysis uh, um, made uh, in order to compare the cap capability abilities of your classifier to meet it. Yeah, basically the whole study was um, sort of a idea: can we reduce the complexity in these high-dimensional spaces of classification and thus uh, generate um, uh, better generalizing models? So. We don't know really what the distribution in these, because we have just too few samples. You know, we would need millions or billions to really do good density estimations. Uh, uh, exactly. And so, even if you have like uh, just margin-based um, Bayesian classification or so, it, it just wouldn't work. So um, usually people don't do that. One one approach would be some sort of robustness analysis, going back to ordinal data and so on. We are doing that. But one approach would put it into the concept class itself, and this is what we just did here. So basically, we think that these reduced um, classifiers are more, sens more sensible. This even works with dimensionality reduction in the support vector machine. I didn't show that data at all. This is just the standard. It would be just too much for this talk. But um, in the paper, we have also a dim dimensionality reduction support vector machine course, which imposes additional uh, constraints and it shrinks the weights and so on. And um, yeah, but the behavior is the same. So we would argue very much for using these lesser complex um, um, concept classes for these high dimensional, high dimensional data. One more question, please. general comment. There does seem to be a principle that applies uh, that sometimes surprisingly simple models do really rather well in classification problems compared to much more flexible and sophisticated models. And there must be some kind of bias trade variance trade-off going under there at a fundamental level. But Yes, you can capture it. And, and one notion of capturing is like uh, the VC dimension and the, and the pack, pack probably approximately cor um, correct. Learning um, framework because it sort of captures the notion of how flexible your your um, classifier is you know if it's quite rigid and if it really performs okay or quite well then I would rather use choose the lesser complex model whatever complexity means in this case we thought the only notion that we had or that only notion that we thought of in the first place was VC dimension, Vapnik Chavanenkis dimension, to um, yeah, grasp this notion of more somehow rigidness, more, more stiffness in the model, you know, less flexibility. Of course, one simple notion would be just the number of parameters, you know, but this doesn't, you know, for, for random force, it's just, you know, it, it, it depends how, 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 how complex your Ground, the ground model is you have. So you have to, yeah. of course, um, Akaiki information criterion, Bayesian information criterion, all, all point to that in that direction. But this, these are more data dependent, and VC dimensions not. You know, it's, yeah. it's just a combinatorial measure of how much can be shattered, how many points can be shattered in what way. Okay, let us thank okay. this our speaker again. And uh, I think we'll continue last, that uh, way. Speaker, this is uh, Frederick Betz. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, the title of uh, her talk is uh, Price and Product Design Strategies for Manufacturers of Electrical Vehicles, uh, Vehicle Batteries, Inferences from Blood and Plasma.
much for that kind introduction. So um, I'm delighted to be here today to give a talk on the price and product design strategies for manufacturers of batteries for electric vehicles. And during my talk, I'm going to show you the results of a discrete choice experiment I conducted with Chinese uh, respondents. And I use the data in order to estimate latent class models. And then I draw inferences for uh, the design and the price strategies for these uh, battery manufacturers. So my talk is divided into four parts. And firstly, I would like to give a brief introduction to this whole um, area of uh, battery electric vehicles. I'm going to show you um, the problem cluster, or the so-called problem cluster of electromobility. And uh, then I will very, very briefly lay a focus on the model, the latent class multinomial logic model I use for uh, the estimation. And um, then I will uh, show you the empirical study. I will show you the data, as well as the model selection process, because it is not clear a priori how many heterogeneity we have within our data, which means how many segments we have within our data. And then I'm going to show you the results as well as the inferences I draw. And last but not least, of course, I'm going to conclude. So um, let's start with an introduction. So um, nowadays, battery electric vehicles constitute a permanent alternative to vehicles with combustion motors. And um, as you can see, uh, there's absolutely a tremendously increasing worldwide worldwide demand for battery electric vehicles. So for example, five years ago, there was a worldwide demand of approximately 750 uh, vehicles, which already quintupled in 2017 and still increasing. Um, quite important, uh, there are some country-specific differences. So what we can see, China is uh, the land which is far um, in front of all other countries because uh, BVs in China are widely used, and this is due to political regulations. So for example, in comparison, Germany is, is far behind. Mm -hmm. Not only from the demand side, but also from uh, the supplier side or the manufacturer side, we can see that Chinese BV manufacturers are uh, market leaders. So the market share of Chinese manufacturers is um, twice as high as those in comparison for German BV manufacturers like uh, Volkswagen or Audi and so on. So um, quite important, it's a battery electric vehicle. So the core component of this battery electric vehicle is a battery. And uh, I've got a picture of a battery here just to give you an impression. So um, what is absolutely clear is that with the demand of a battery uh, electric vehicles, the demand of batteries uh, derivatively increases. So um, what we knew as well is that the battery is a great matter of expense. So that means that uh, approximately 20% of the cost for the whole battery electric vehicle dispends to the battery. So you can see there were a lot of cost improvements during the last years. So um, we've got the cost for reservoir capacity measured by kilowatt hour. So in 2007, the cost per kilowatt hour were by approximately 1,000 euro. And last year, um, we found a measure of 200 euro. However, only if the costs are lower than 130 euros, we can say that the costs are equal to vehicles with combustion motors. So. Um, there's a lot of competition uh, within uh, this market for batteries, for electric vehicles. Just to name uh, the top um, manufacturers of batteries for electric vehicles, Panasonic, Built Your Dream, or LG Cham. However, there are a lot of more manufacturers. So the competition is high. And uh, battery manufacturers uh, could actually gain a competitive advantage if they solve the problems or the components of the so-called problem cluster of electromobility. So uh, the problem cluster constitutes of three components, but the first component is the driving range. And here this noon from uh, several studies that the driving range, which is lower or shorter than 150 kilometers, is actually not accepted by uh, the customers. 
The second uh, component is the infrastructure and charging time or recharging um, of uh, the battery holds in this component. Um, and here it is known that customers would like to recharge their, their car overnight. So a recharging time, which is larger or, or longer than eight hours, is absolutely not accepted by customers. And the last point is the purchase price. And uh, from now on, we see that um, the purchase price for battery electric vehicles is higher in comparison to the purchase price of um, vehicles with combustion motors. However, I did not take into account any subsidies. So quite important, and this is what I did within my talk, is um, I took a look at these um, battery um, manufacturers and their customers are BV manufacturers. So battery manufacturers have to take into account the preferences of BV manufacturers. However, BV manufacturers have to take into account the preferences of BV customers. So um, derivatively, we can say that battery manufacturers actually do have to take into account the preferences of BV um, customers. And um, keep in mind this, this figure or this preference relationship here because uh, I will come back to this later on. So um, the central question or the roadmap of my talk is the following. What I did is I do some market segmentation by using BV customers and then I'm going to explore some segment-specific differences concerning the preferences of these segments. And then I'm going to draw some implication for um, the battery's design or even the pricing. So in particular, I'm going to ask if there's an opportunity to do some product or some price differentiation. So quite important, this is the central question. I'd like to determine these strategies. Okay, very, very briefly, because I think you're all familiar with, uh, with this topic, it's about this latent class multinomial logic model I use for the estimation. So um, experimental conjoint chase analysis is among the most frequently used method for measuring and analyzing segment-specific consumer preferences, and the data from such experiments have been typically analyzed with the latent class multinomial logic model. So as you already know, this everything follows random utility theory where it is assumed that uh, the utility or respondent to the, that alternative that provides the biggest utility to him and the utility could be decomposed into a deterministic part and a random irritant. So the deterministic part is just the sum of those part worth utility estimates or for those attribute levels that are realized within a certain alternative and um, on the other hand, we've got this random irreturn which captures all that effects that are not included within the deterministic part. So uh, quite important, if we assume this random irreturn to be IAD Gamble distributed, then uh, the multinomial logic model results. So um, this logic model or uh, the assumption of this random distributed um, irreturn to be Gamble distributed has a nice effect that our probability of a respondent for choosing a specific alternative has a closed form solution. And what we are interested in is the estimation of these part worth utility estimates as well as in the estimation of these relative segment shares. And we can do this by using some maximum likelihood um, estimation and the my likelihood here looks like this. Okay, quite important, I think you're already familiar with that, is that a latent class model assigns respondents to certain segments with a certain probability. So for example, if there are two segments, a respondent may have a 90% probability to be sorted to the first and a 10% probability to be sorted to the second segment. So uh, however, the larger the discrepancy of these so-called uh, posterior probabilities of membership, the better the separation between the segments. And we are going to use this uh, later on as a measure in order to, um, to classify our um, heterogeneity or to determine the number of uh, segments we have within our data. However, um, we could do some um, discrete segmentation by assigning a respondent to that segment for which he or she has the highest probability or posterior probability of segment membership in order if we would like to profile these segments. Okay, now, the empirical study, and I think this is uh, the most important part here. 
um, what I already uh, told you, what I did is I conducted a discrete choice experiment with uh, Chinese uh, respondents. I did some data cleaning and the final uh, sample consists of 194 respondents. Um, and the respondents were asked to choose out their preferred BV alternative, which were constructed by uh, four attributes, uh, driving range, charging time, and price. Uh, these uh, attributes correspond to the problem cluster of electromobility. And as a fourth attribute, I used this car body design because it has been shown that the car body design is a very um, important attribute for Chinese respondents when they choose a car. So um, as you can see, the driving range as well as the charging time and the price here, the price is measured in uh, Yuan, it's a Chinese currency. Um, approximately one yuan is approximately uh, 13 uh, euro cent. Um, quite important, we took attribute uh, levels here, um, which corresponds to the attribute of the top 20 Chinese um, most sold BV cars so far. However, we did not take into account the car of Tesla, because Tesla is much more expensive and the driving range is much higher. They're not comparable to uh, these other cars. So quite important, I set up a choice design containing um, 10 choice sets, and each choice set contains three BV alternatives as well as a no purchase option. Okay, so first of all, as I already said, we do not know how many heterogeneity we have within our data, so therefore we have to do some model selection. Um, therefore, I used uh, three performance criteria. But the first one is model fit, which was measured by the adjusted uh, BIC criteria. This actually panels a higher number of parameters to be estimated. Um, then I took a look at the predictive validity. Here I measured the first choice hit rates by considering two holdout choice sets. And I took a look at the separation, as I already presented to you here, used as a measure this mean posterior uh, probabilities of segment membership. So in this slide, you can see uh, the results. I estimated uh, finite mixture or latent class models considering one up to eight segments. So seg uh, eight segments is um, twice as high as the number which is commonly found in empirical studies, which is of three or four segments. And um, as you can see here, the um, model fit um, decreases up to, uh, increases up to six segment solution and then it, uh, decreases, um, the separation or, excuse me, the predictive validity is highest for the six-segment solution. Just, just keep in mind, there were four alternatives within our segments. So if you've got a coin flip model, we would have a 25% chance in order to select the right one. So here, our model um, has prediction of approximately 60%, so that's quite okay. And you can see for the mean um, posterior probability, there's a decrease up to five segment solution, then a little peak. And this is why I considered to take a look at the six segment solution. So uh, first of all, let's take a look at this relative segment sizes for the six segment solution. We've got one segment, which is uh, quite big, 36%. Uh, relative share and the one segment, segment four, it's quite small of 7%. However, there were approximately 20 persons in this segment, so it's quite okay to do some evaluation. And you can see here in the slide the most preferred um, BV um, attribute levels by segment. So um, as you can see, the first and the sixth segment prefer an SUV. Um, the third segment prefers an estate car and uh, the other segments prefer seed, and however they differ in the other attribute levels they mostly prefer. So actually, uh, we have well-separated designs. Um, this also holds if we take a look at the relative attribute importances. The first three segments actually care about the driving range, um, the last three segments about the car body design, and the fourth segments, well, attach equally high importances to uh, the purchase price and the charge. So once more, this argues for well separation, and now I'm going to use this uh, results concerning the most preferred attribute levels and uh, the attribute importances in order to draw some implications. 
So um, what we can see is that as we customers um, attach the highest importance to driving range, purchase price, or the car body design, um, estate car customers attach the highest importance to driving range, but, and this is quite important, they prefer a higher price, which means they see price as a quality signal. And uh, I will come to that back later on. And we've got our seeding customers, they either exclusively care about the car body design or to the attributes that are associated to this problem cluster of electromobility. So now, what we, or how could we use this result in order to draw some implications? As you can see, um, all um, batteries for all types of cars do actually need a high reservoir capacity, and um, for seedings, we do actually need a uh, quick uh, recharging technique. For estate cars, we're actually able to do some price or some product uh, differentiation. So what does it mean? So as we've already learned, estate car customers view price as a quality signal, which means actually we could um, sell uh, batteries that are identically constructed to batteries for SUVs or estate cars and seeding cars to um, estate cars, uh, cars um, suppliers because um, we can just charge higher prices because the estate car uh, manufacturers could easily transport these higher prices to their customers. Uh, on the other hand, we can actually do some product um, differentiation because uh, since this battery may have higher costs due to these higher prices, we could actually fulfill um, the cars or preferences, uh, the customer's preferences concerning a wider driving range or charger recharging time. Okay, just to conclude, what I showed to you was uh, a discrete choice experiment which was uh, conducted with these Chinese respondents and I estimated latent class models and explored these segment specific preference differences and brought some implications for the BEV manufacturers and this already holds because this preference relationship here holds. Okay, just to conclude, we just uh, saw that BV customers actually differ in the preferences concerning the car body design or the attributes associated to this problem cluster of electromobility. We saw that all BV customers uh, prefer a wider driving range and a quick uh, recharging time. This holds especially for seeding customers and for estate cars, uh, we were actually able to do some product or some price differentiation. Okay, so far, and then I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, I would ask you one question. Yes. Uh, very nice. I have a question concerning um, the bias of the Chinese. People, because I drive a hybrid myself, so <laughs> um, and I found it quite interesting this result that people would go for higher prices mm. and long, um, s not so intense changes and so on. But I, that's what I mm. have been. Um, well, actually, uh, we, we do see this in, in other countries as well. It's, it's not a real whole uh, Chinese issue. Um, but commonly, uh, you would say um, you, you view price uh, in form of a transaction costs and not as a quality signal. However, in um, countries from Asia, especially in China, we knew that um, there's some kind of status. So people prefer a car which is really expensive in order to um, show or to express how wealthy they are and that they're able to uh, um, to buy a car which is uh, quite expensive. So it's just a, a, cu a cultural point at this on. And, uh, and uh, maybe another question, sorry, mm -hmm. Francesco. Um, is, is the study biased because you don't use the Tesla? Because this would be, you know, the most prestigious yeah. um, maybe car in that respect? Mm. Um, absolutely. So um, we actually decided to take not into account uh, Tesla because Tesla is 
so much more expensive than these, these other ca um, cars and, and the driving range is so much wider and, and this absolutely corresponds. So we actually do focus on this because um, Tesla uh, would actually bias this uh, to another point. So I think we could view um, Tesla as an outlier <laughs> and, and this is why we considered uh, all, all these other cars. But maybe for, for future research th this might be a, a great uh, component that we could include. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any more questions for the floor? I'm just a curious, and uh, I'm not an expert of uh, electrical vehicles, and neither of batteries. But I have been, my, my impression that the, the choices offered to your um, sample is based on uh, several items that are highly correlated because uh, the kind of the vehicle and the, the charging time and also the capacity are almost mm -hmm. co so when proposing them uh, the in generally in such kind of model we assume that the um, items are independent so how does this affect mm -hmm. your estimations or believe that? Yeah, um, we did this as an initial study in order to get an impression what are the um, attributes that are important and um, how does it look like for uh, these attribute levels. And we um, actually view it from a marketing perspective and did not take into account that absolutely if, if there's a higher um, driving range then this actually would result in a larger recharging uh, technique and so on or, or a longer recharging time. But th you're absolutely right <laughs> this is, uh, for future research. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's thank again all the speakers and it's lunch time.